<laughs> Dude, never did it. All right, welcome back to Never Did It, the podcast where myself, Brad Garoon, and my good buddy Jake Ziegler are going through the past 100 years of movies and assigning each other a movie to watch that the other one's never seen before. Although this week we're doing it a little differently because I have never seen any movies that Jake had never seen in 1950. Does that make sense? Jake has seen all the movies that I've seen from 1950. And we're doing 1950, so because Jake's such a 1950 movie buff, I had to pick a movie that neither of us had seen. And I picked Night and the City. Jake, what did you think of Night and the City? It is bleak, man. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a rough watch. I mean, I like that noir stuff, and I really like the uh, you know seemingly ordinary man falling into th- things that he can't control and things you know just get you know spiral and spiral but man it's uh it, it's a it's a tough watch i mean it's it's just it's really hard uh, you know what i'm noticing about noirs they all have it coming yeah there's never like i i have a hard time feeling bad like i watched both versions of nightmare alley i watched this we already talked about um double indemnity for an earlier podcast these are not great people and i never feel particularly bad for them when their life falls apart right and because you just know it's going to happen. I mean, you can tell within the first five minutes. I mean, what you know, just what kind of scam artist this guy is. And I was, I mean, that's the first scene. You know, is his girlfriend refuses to give him this money that he thinks he needs for this one scheme that's finally going to work. You know, so you just you, you get a lot of background really in this like in the really in the first five minutes of the movie it tells you almost everything you need to know about the guy and I thought that was really it was just really a good start it just kind of kept going along that line and and it's good I think it's really great I thought it looked great. Uh, and the performances are excellent, but yeah, it's just it's a it's a major downer. So for those who don't know, which is probably a lot of people, because this movie is real hard to find. This movie was directed by I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but I'm assuming it's Jules Dassin. That would be my guess. Yeah, he's American. Was American. One of the reasons I think it's so hard to find his movies is he was blacklisted during that era of Hollywood. So most of his movies are not American, including this one, are not American productions. His most famous movie, Rafifi, is very French. This movie is British, although it does have an American lead. Three of the leads are American: um, the con artist, his his love interest, and her friend. That role was kind of weird. Yeah, that one was, uh, I don't know if that quite added as much to the movie as maybe they thought it did. Right. I guess it was just to have someone for her to talk to Mm -hmm. when he wasn't around. Although the fact that they made it a male friend made you wonder if there was going to be like a a love triangle type deal going on. And that never, nothing like that ever happened. It never materialized, but I do think maybe they kind of did that to, you know, kind of increase his paranoia. You know, to, um, you know, just kind of have w- just one more thing for this guy to worry about. You know, he's got so much going on that could go so wrong for him. And, you know, then here's his girlfriend has this, you know, kind of almost like a ready-made, you know, other boyfriend that she could go to right. at almost any time. And I think that kind of, uh, it's just another, th- another in the long line, or the long list of things that are going wrong for this guy. But it didn't, but he didn't, or could he go never, wrong, really? yeah. And rather than do that, so the plot of this movie is, like you said, Richard Woodmark plays this guy, Han- Harry Fabian, who everyone just calls Fabian. I have never seen Richard Woodmark in any other movie except the original Murder on the Orient Express, where he plays the character who would be recast as Johnny Depp. So and that movie came out twenty four years twenty four years later. So he's completely unrecognizable in his like I'm sure leading well this in this his leading man era. I'd never seen him or anyone else in this movie before, with the exception of Stanislaw Zabisco, yeah. <laughs> uh, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, so he's a con man and he's going from scummy place to scummy place in the city looking for a new mark. And in doing so, he finds Stanislaw Zabisco, who plays uh, Gregorius, the greatest, most traditional wrestler in the world, <laughs> uh, professional wrestler. And it's actually kind of wild the way they introduce wrestling, because it's a great analog to the conversations people have about wrestling today, 70 years later. Mm-hmm. Because the referee is, like, climbing over people's backs, and they're doing, like, wacky stuff in the ring at this wrestling match he goes to, but Stannis, and the and the match is promoted by Gregorius' son, who's fine with all this newfangled, wacky wrestling, but Gregorius hates it. He wants to be traditional. <laughs> He's the Jim Cornette of his day. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Harry sees him as an easy mark to take over the wrestling business in uh, London by lying to him and saying that he's happy to do traditional wrestling. It's actually not really a con as much as it's just doing different wrestling in the in the yeah. region. It's kind of funny that the thing that he ends up losing his life for was not that bad. Right. Yeah, it was the most honest thing he'd probably ever done. Right. At least as far as we know in the movie, yeah. And maybe we feel that way because we are actual wrestling fans and we know that like competition is probably good 
And, <laughs> and and that also Gregorius' son is a criminal, clearly. I was blown away by the fact that like the arguments about wrestling haven't changed in 70 years and that this is a backdoor wrestling movie. Yeah. I, I did not know that. And of course, obviously, I didn't know a whole lot about it when you suggested either. But yeah, I did not know. I didn't read anything about it beforehand. I just, you know, started watching it. And, and yeah, then all of a sudden there's wrestling. And I'm like, okay, one of these guys has to be a wrestler. And I looked it up and it's, you know, Larry Zabisco's dad. Yep. Like, I've worked shows with Larry Zabisco. You know, I've had, I had a conversation with Larry Zabisco where he asked me what the plan was for that night. And I'm like, maybe you should explain that you are a wrestling referee. Yes. Yeah, I did. It was when I was refereeing and I was, uh, it was me and Larry were booked as the referees that night. And I think I did most of the matches and he was going to do like the two big ones. So he comes up to me. He's like, so what's the plan for tonight? I don't know. So people may have heard of Larry Zabisco because he gained some fame in WCW for people our age. Definitely anyone younger than us doesn't know who he is. And if you're not a wrestling fan, you have no idea who he is because he didn't have any crossover fame but he was like a big in the midwest and then big nationally because of wcw and then his dad i mean you only know him i mean no one alive was is a stanislav zabisco fan well and i'm one of the people who i know i've known larry probably as long as i've known wrestling because i grew up in minnesota and he wrestled for the awa out of minneapolis so yeah i knew i always known who larry was and and then having worked with them i'm like oh my gosh that's his dad that just kind of blew my mind a little bit right so he's very greek in this he is the most greek person that's ever greeked and it's amazing and he's for a non-actor he's terrific yep. and you know what the guy who plays uh the strangler who is uh gregorius's like rival in the movie it's a guy named mike mazursky who was in a lot of movies and i actually thought he was maybe the best part of this movie i, I thought he was fantastic in this i wrote in my notes when he first popped up, i'm like this guy reminds me of ron perlman Ron Perlman did the role in the new Nightmare Alley that Mike Mazursky did in the original Nightmare Alley. <laughs> I didn't know that. So, well, when you, when we go over the new Nightmare Alley for this podcast, we'll we'll talk about that again. He's also great in that. Yeah. What's also interesting too is that there was a, there was a wrestler called the Strangler, but that was Ed Lewis. Right. It certainly wasn't Mike Mazursky. I can say with some confidence there were multiple wrestlers called the Strangler, but it wasn't Mike. No, Mike Mazursky wrestled as Mike Mazursky, mm-hmm. and he wrestled. He once wrestled Bruno San Martino. I learned when I looked him up on Cage Match. Uh, yeah. Bruno San Martino, for those who aren't wrestling fans, is one of the most successful wrestlers of all time. But he's even before our time. He was uh, big in the '50s, '60s, '70s, and then started to hate wrestling because of Hulk Hogan in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> so pretty good performances all around. I think there's also this other angle where Fabian has this con artist friend who backstabs him and he gets in line with uh, Gregorius's son and they because he thinks that he's sleeping with his wife, even though he's really just using his wife to get... Uh, what did he need her for even? I can't remember. Oh, money. Yeah, because he was trying to find the... Yeah, he needed someone to bankroll because his girlfriend wouldn't give him the money. Right. And then he, in turn, gives her, like, a false liquor license for a restaurant or a nightclub she wants to open, which turns into just, like, a funny bit later in the movie. It's a pretty great movie. Yeah, it's it's one that I um, I initially gave it four stars uh, when after I'd watched it and you know put it on Letterbox, but it's one that's it's kind of stuck with me. Just a lot of the images, even the the cinematography in this is fantastic. I mean, you can I've seen some still images, and once I looked up some more stuff about the movie, just get prepared to talk about this. Someone who had talked about the cinematography and showed like some of these still images from the movie. It's like it's incredible the way like some of the shots are laid out, like the way they, the way they play with the light and the shadows and everything. I mean, you can tell uh, if it wasn't a slapdash production. I mean, this guy was he was into it, you know. Well, Jules D- Dassin, who it might be Descent, but Jules Dassin, we know he's an incredible director. I was Mutz Greenbaum. Mutz Greenbaum. That is an interesting name. Is the cinema the cinematographer for this movie? Yeah. How is that simultaneously the most Italian and most Jewish name I've ever heard? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's probably the Mutz is probably Yiddish. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. that makes sense. Speaking of the lighting, I wrote in my notes a joke that was really funny in my head and not so funny when I say it out loud. But I was like, you could call this day for night in the city because none of the night yeah. scenes are filmed at night. There's no way. There's so much <laughs> shadow in these <laughs> night scenes. And some of them just straight up look like there's daylight yeah. in them. But it's I just think day for night is the most interesting trick. Mm-hmm. How blown out most of those sets have been mm-hmm. for them to be able to turn it down. Anyway, cool movie. Very hard to find. Well, not very hard to find. It's not, like most movies that aren't streaming on any major platform. You can find it on YouTube. It's it's there a couple of places. It's a pretty. It's good quality too. And there's subtitles on the YouTube video that I watched, but they're bad. Do you have anything else on this movie? It was one I was definitely glad I watched. You know, because I like noir stuff, and this was a new one for me that I didn't really know about. Didn't know much about the director or anything. And I got to see Larry Zbysko's dad in a movie, which again was the only movie he'd ever been in. So that you know that was the one chance we had. So right. I'm glad we took it. He did a good job. I'll just say two things real quick. One, I really there were two things about the structure of the movie that I thought were interesting. One I liked and one I didn't like. The one I didn't like as much was we as the audience always knew more than Harry about what was going on. So I kind of felt like I was waiting for him to catch up. 
I guess the fact that he never caught up made it worth it, but it's a little weird when you're waiting for the character to catch up with you. Like, you're not going to be surprised. Right. He's going to be surprised. Right, right. The thing I did like, there were a lot of open, like, they brought on a lot of little weird characters in the beginning of the movie when Harry was looking for his new con. And they all came back in the movie later in a pretty significant way, each one. He had this forger who helped him get the liquor license. He had this little old lady who, like, steals stuff from riverboats. And she hid him for a few minutes at the end of the movie. Mm -hmm. And then there was the guy who, I don't know what his job was, but he was the guy who turned him in. Yeah. And uh, and ended up getting him killed. So I like that all three of those characters came back in the end. I wasn't expecting it. Well, and he sacrifices himself, though, at the end, too. And maybe, like, the one, you know, redeeming thing that he does in the rest of the movie with him just doing kind of shady, underhanded things. He, you know, he redeems himself and saves his girlfriend in the end. I don't know that she was in danger. What he was trying to do was get her the reward money that had been put on his head. Right, there we go. I do think the interesting question is, because he even bungles that, <laughs> like, he can't even do that right, there's a question of whether or not Gregorius' son will give her the money. Because he just runs through the streets screaming, you betrayed me, you betrayed me. <laughs> Status loss, give, her, give this lousy bee the money. He tried, at least. You know, there was, there was some effort to do something nice for someone else. <laughs> right. But I do like that he d- even did that poorly. That was pretty funny. And then gets, like, weird, thrown in the river in the weirdest way. Yeah. So, yeah, the two questions are, did his girlfriend get the reward money? And did Gregorius' son get arrested? Because we see the Strangler getting arrested at the end of the movie. Definitely check it out. I gave it four stars also. I thought it was a lot of fun. Yep, it's, yeah, it's a good one for sure. And then you assigned me Sunset Boulevard, very famous movie. Donald Trump's favorite movie, turns out. Oh, God, is it? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a weird one for him to like the best. I'm going to say, I can't picture him sitting through, A, like, any movie for, you you know, two hours at at all. But but this one particularly, that is surprising. Yeah, he says he loves it. Tell us about it. Uh, Well, Sunset Boulevard uh, is very famous. It's a Billy Wilder film. Billy Wilder is known as one of the greatest directors of all time. It's also got uh, William Holden. Gloria Swanson uh, plays the main character named Norma Desmond. Uh, She used to be a silent film star, and she is, uh, she's trying to make a comeback in, in the talking film era, but, you know, she's, uh, the business may have passed her by. And that's kind of the, the, the setup for it. It's got a lot of these these famous lines in it. Like there's that one very famous line that even if you haven't seen the movie, you've probably heard was there's I'm ready for my close up. You know, it's the pictures that were small. Yeah, I can't remember the exact one, but something like yeah, the pictures were were small. And it's got a lot of these these really great lines. Like it's it's very Billy Wilder. It's certainly one of his more famous and and more highly regarded films that he did. Yeah. So the the driving force of the movie is also it's, it's also kind of a noir. I don't know if you necessarily categorize it as such. It's got elements, noirish elements. There's a there's a not so great great guy he's a writer he's running away from repo men in the car that he doesn't want to get repossessed and he winds up at her house um, and he wants to hide out there and then it's about their relationship as he tells her she's a writer she's written a movie to get her back in the pictures she wants uh, Cecil B. DeMille to direct it because he directed her in silent films this writer knows that it's crap that it's a terrible script and that no one will hire her but he's broke so he leads her on essentially and she falls in love with him and he has a weird relationship with her he's also really into his best friend's fiance, and there's a whole shtick between those two. What was struck me about this movie is how influential it was in terms of people making, like, meta movies. Because this is a very meta movie. Like you mentioned, Gloria Swanson was in real life a silent film star. The person who plays her butler, who was in the movie, he was her director, one of the other directors who loved her. He was also a silent film star. Cecil B. DeMille plays himself in the movie, as someone who transcended silent films into the talkies. I don't know that there was a movie like this before this. I assume not. I can't think of anything that's like that now. There's tons of stuff like this now. Mm -hmm. This is Tarantino, what he's doing now. This is Get Shorty. This is This is Tropic Thunder. This is what any movie about Hollywood is now, with a mix of people playing themselves and people playing analogs of real people. Right. Yeah, this has got to be one of the most influential movies of all time. Oh, agreed. Definitely. I mean, just to, to turn, maybe it's a cliche or a lame phrase, but like, it's just kind of, it's kind of turning the camera back on itself almost. Like it's kind of, you know, really looking into how the movies get made. And one thing I remember about the, the butler too, is that he writes fake fan mail right. to the Gloria Swanson character to keep her, you know, kind of keep her spirits up and everything because she's, you know, hasn't been in a movie in such a long time, but he you know, wants her to think that she still has fans and that that works pretty well because she does think that. Interesting story about this. You mentioned turning the camera back on the industry. So Billy Wilder, I think safe to say, you mentioned earlier, but I think safe to say one of the best directors we've had. Yeah. He, this movie was produced through Paramount, but I think 
it was someone at MGM who got into like almost a fist fight with Wilder over this movie. Really? Yeah, my fiance told me about it. I can't remember who the producer was. Apparently there was some like, just like a huge fight between them. He was so furious that he made this movie that made Hollywood look so bad because, spoiler alert for a 70 year old movie, Gloria Swanson goes insane, completely insane by the end, and kills the writer and has to be, and is arrested. The final scene when she says her famous line, I'm ready for my close-up, mm-hmm. it's not Cecil B. DeMille who's filming her, it's the news cameras that are filming. Um, and it makes, so it makes Hollywood, look, by today's standards, this does not make Hollywood look that bad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the standards of its time, the studios had a lock on morality in film, and this was not done. If you watch any movie about Hollywood today, it's way worse than any movie about Hollywood back oh, then. Oh, yeah. But this, I mean, even brought up that how female stars, how they quote, I hate to say this, but how they quote, you know, age out of roles and how, like, once they get to a certain age, they're not considered anymore. And, yeah. I mean, that, for the time, yeah, it would have to be. I'm sure it was known, but nobody really said it out loud kind of thing. It's more like something, I mean, we talk about that a lot today, and, and it's getting better. It's not great still, but a little. Probably better in that audiences are now segmented enough that you could get a movie produced about older women for older women, but there's still not that much. Like when Book Club came out a couple of years ago, that was still seen as a big deal. Yeah, and I no, worked at a not. movie theater when that happened, and that movie... I sold so many tickets to that movie really? to really that crowd of people. And it played for uh, probably like two or three months because it just kept drawing that uh, it was a matinee audience every time. You know, it would do great business at the one and the three o'clock shows, but didn't do anything at the seven or the nine. Sure, you know? that makes sense. And then, this, but like, think about 20, we're in 2022 now. Let's think about this year. What has come out that's really focused on older women? There's that movie about, uh, what's her name from um, from Junior? Why is that my my reference for her? <laughs> Gosh, who's in Junior? I don't think I ever saw Junior. She was Arnold Schwarzenegger's love interest in Junior. <laughs> She's a very famous British actress. She was in love, actually. Oh, is it Emma Thompson? Emma Thompson. So they made that movie about her being with a much younger man in uh, this year. I forget what it's called. Good luck to you, Leo Grand. Yes, that. What else? Uh, 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 the remake of The Father of the Bride came out with uh, Gloria Stefan, right? That came out. Um, I mean, I think everything, everywhere, all at once. You know, Michelle Yeoh is is you know she's a little that's bit older. A great one. She's you know definitely a a main character in that. And also, Leo Grand is a terrific movie too. And I think you would really like it. I haven't heard great things, so I'll check it out. And then I guess we had what's her name in Isabella Rossellini's voice in Marcel the Shell. Mm-hmm. But like these, I think everything, everywhere, all at once, and Leo Grand. Those two movies are a great example because they stick out. But like that's it. <laughs> I mean, we just named off like all of them in you know thirty seconds. Right. So I don't know that I don't know that it's gotten that much better. I mean, look, it's gotten better in that there are movies that exist where in 1950 this was it. I guarantee that's the only starring role for an older woman that year. I, yeah, I think that's a safe bet. But if Frances McDormand and Meryl Streep didn't exist, these movies wouldn't get made. Right. <laughs> Um, and Kate Blanchett isn't quite old enough to count her yet, so yeah. Well, she's got she's got another one coming out this year uh, that's just been tearing up the film festival circuit. Yeah, yeah, but she's not that old. No. Like she's in her forties. Fifty three. Oh wow, she looks amazing. Uh, so I like this movie. I gave it four stars. I probably didn't appreciate it as much when I watched it as I do thinking back on it because of how influential it turned out to be. And I wasn't thinking about that when I was watching it. I was more focused on the narrative of the main character. And he's not that interesting. And he's crappy. And uh, doesn't feel like he ever learns anything. And then he dies. (laughs) So, and also the movie starts with him dying. So that's not a spoiler. The movie starts with him dead in a pool. Right. That's a very famous shot too. Yeah. So four stars, which I I still liked it a lot. If I were to rate it again, I'd probably go at least four and a half. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have it headed as a five. It's been a while since I've I've seen it, but I went through a phase where I was deeply obsessed with Billy Wilder. I watched a bunch of his movies. I was like, these are all five stars. Yeah, I just went nuts. That sounds That's correct cool. to me. I mean, I love The Apartment. I love this movie. Double Indemnity is incredible. Uh, Some Like It Hot is Billy Wilder. I haven't seen it yet. It's on the list. Oh, man. A, yeah. That's we'll talk about it soon. What else? Wait, now I just really quick want to go over. Like, I feel like there's at least one other Billy. What- oh, Ace in the Hole. Oh, I can't wait to talk about Ace in the Hole. Uh, Sabrina is a very famous one. Uh, the Lost Weekend was a Best Picture winner and everything. So, yeah. I mean, he's so, got- we'll be talking about a lot more of these. I'm glad we I'm glad we got another Jules Dassin movie in here. I'm glad we talked about Billy Wilder some more. We'll, although, more from him for sure later. Mm-hmm. That's it for 1950. Now we did it. We done did it. We'll be back next week with 1980. Yeah, a little 30-year gap there. A little 30-year gap to watch a couple of comedies.